Welcome to the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Right this way. Your therapist will see you shortly. In the meantime, sit back, kick your feet up on the couch, and get ready to focus on adding very valuable tools to your marriage toolkit. And now your host and marriage counselor, David Taylor. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode. How y'all doing today? I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm feeling excited. <laughs> anyway, this is David Taylor and I am your host. And I would like to welcome you to the Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast. Now, hopefully by now you've been listening. You've been a, an avid listener. You're waiting every Monday at midnight, waiting for the podcast episode to drop. But if you're new to this episode, welcome to this podcast. The Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast, by the way, if you don't know by now, it's a place where you're going to get credible and tangible marriage-related information from a licensed mental health counselor. Now, over the past 19 years of my clinical experience, I've been discovering some things, guys. I've been working and I've found some things that I believe will work to make your marriage healthy. So, I want you to see these episodes as a master class in marriage where I take a psychological and practical approach to marriage education and enrichment. And this particular episode is going to be more of a motivational speech, right? Because if you listen to episode 11, you know what this is going to be all about. This is part two to the episode that I did last week, which was episode number 11, where I discussed finding your purpose while being married. So again, this is going to be the second part of that episode. If you are brand new and you're starting here, go back, listen to episode 11, or actually go all the way back, listen to episode number one, and then catch up, play some catch up so that you can know exactly what I'm I'm talking about today. Now, as I shared in last week's episode, this is one of my most favorite topics to discuss, and it's something that I've been researching since around 2006, and actually, I believe it's actually earlier then 2006, if I look back at some of my notes and some of my journals, uh, this information is important. I, I firmly believe that this information that you are gaining here in the previous episode, not just because I'm sharing it, but just the topic in and of itself, the subject matter, it's so important that the lives of those that you come in contact with, they're depending on you having this information. So, You want to make sure that you're paying attention, that you're taking notes, that you're answering the questions that I'm posing, because this stuff, I promise you, if you apply it, it will work. So I'm not going to even bore you with all the additional introduction because I want to go ahead and dive right in and get started with this part two to the episode where I discuss finding your purpose while being married. So let's dive in and let's get this party started. Now, let's do a recap first. Let me let me start with a brief recap. I'm not going to give you all of what I discussed in the previous episode. You can go back and find that. But just for a brief recap, remember I mentioned that the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life without a purpose. Okay? And I talked about what that means. I also said that your marriage is only as strong as its weakest link. So if you're married, but you don't know your purpose, you are severely handicapping the growth and success of your marriage. I'll go further to say that you're handicapping the potential success of your marriage because not all marriages are going to be successful. I'm just going to be honest, okay? (laughs) Now, I also went on to say that God is only interested in your purpose. He's interested in what you could do, but haven't done. That's potential. And I said that God gave you your potential to fulfill your purpose. And lastly, I discussed six questions that you absolutely must answer for your life, as well as six principles on how to understand your purpose while being married. Now, again, if this doesn't ring a bell, just go back and listen to the previous episode. Make sure that you've answered those six questions. And also, I wrapped up by uh, sharing this, that you were born to solve a problem. Never let the circumstances of your life deter you from finding your solution. You are God's response to a need that he knew would exist in your lifetime. And then I also said, you are an answer to a question that God knew would be asked in this generation. 
So in this episode, I want to further this discussion on finding purpose while being married. And if you've listened to part one of this teaching, you will recall that I made the statement that the quality of your life is determined by the value of your time. And the only way to truly understand the value of your time is to know your purpose and to pursue your purpose. So another way to say this is your value to this world comes from your ability to manifest your purpose. Your value to this world comes from your ability to manifest your purpose. Now, when I use the word value, I'm meaning what something is worth. So whenever you hear me say something like your value to this world, that word value, I'm meaning to describe the worth of something. And your job while being married is to seek to become valuable. Yes, your job while being married is to seek to become valuable. Now, I understand I work with marriages literally on a six to seven day a week basis. I understand how easy it is to actually devalue oneself inside of marriage. But the goal is to become valuable in marriage. Now, one question that you should be constantly asking yourself is, how do I become valuable? How can I increase my value? Not just to my marriage, but to the world. I'll answer that question. And I'll go as far as to say this. To increase your value, you must do one thing. You must become rare. Yes, you must become rare. Now, the problem, though, is that most people determine their personal value based off of the health of the things in their life. So whether it's the health of their marriage, whether it's the health of their job, their financial health, their spiritual health, their physical health, most people determine their value based off of those things. And so they use, for instance, their marriage as a barometer for their health. So if their marriage is bad, then they're dealing with issues. They're allowing the toxicity or the conflicts of their marriage to actually drive them towards making bad choices and doing things that will actually decrease their value, right? So Most of the time, our value is tethered to the health of the things around us. Now, let me share with you a really brief story to kind of illuminate this point. So a guy was at a speaking event and he was sharing a concept and he pulled out a $20 bill and there was about 50 people in the audience that he was speaking to. He pulled out this $20 bill and he asked, he said, show of hand, who in here wants this $20 bill? Everybody raised their hand. So he said, okay, well, give me a second. Somebody's one person is going to get this, but let me ask you a couple additional questions just to really make sure that you really want this $20 bill. So the next thing he did was he took that $20 bill that looked really crisp and new and he balled it up. He crumbled it in his hand and then he unballed it, tried to straighten it out. And he said, Hey, does anybody still want this show of hands? And everybody still raised their hand. So, so then he said, okay, let me, let me, let me, give me, a, let me ask another question. So he balled the $20 bill up, then he threw it on the ground, then he stepped on it, picked the $20 bill up, unballed it, waved it in the air and asked, who wants this $20 bill? And again, everybody raised their hands, right? And so then he took it, balled it up, crumbled it, threw it on the floor, stepped on it, kicked it around, stepped on it some more, balled it up tore even the corner of it, picked it up and asked the question one last time. And guess what? Everybody still raised their hand. So my question to you is, why did even after crumbling the $20 bill, stepping on it, ripping it, kicking it, why did everybody still want that $20 bill? Well, the answer is the $20 bill, the value did not drop based off of how it was handled. That $20 bill was still worth $20, even after it was balled up, crumpled, stepped on, kicked, torn, ripped, right? It was still worth $20. And unfortunately, most people live their life in the complete opposite. See, we come prepackaged with purpose and potential, and our value is set. We just don't know it. We're ignorant. And so then what happens is we allow ourselves to be handled 
or would give life permission to handle us in a way that seemingly decreases our value. We get stepped on, kicked around, balled up, crumpled, ripped, thrown. And then all of a sudden we start to see ourselves as if we lose value based off of how we're handled. Now, I want to say this to you guys, and I need you to hear me clearly. Your marriage, your spouse, life, your job, your boss, your mama, your daddy, your cousin should never have the permission to determine your value. Those things by itself cannot make you rare. Your marriage by itself cannot make you rare. How you're handled on the job whether you get the promotion or you're passed over, whether you're the middle child or not. Those things cannot make you rare. Now, there is something, though, that can make you rare and, by default, increase your value. You become rare by refining your gift. See, your gift is your superpower. That's the thing that you have that makes you unique or rare, your gift. And yes, I'm I'm a comic book junkie. I have two encyclopedias in my office and none of them have to do with uh, physics or biology. <laughs> one is on Marvel characters and one is on DC characters. <laughs> yes, I'm not ashamed. Um, I love superhumans. I love the 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 idea of superpowers and I'm actually, I've been studying, I'm doing a lot of studying, but I've been studying to write my own fiction novel, but I'm also working on my PhD. So I got to get done with that first business before pleasure. (laughs) So I'm getting that out the way, but I got books, multiple books in my office, right? I'm looking at them right now that I'm studying to help me to become a better fiction writer because I have a great story that I would like to tell with regards to individuals with superpowers. I love it. I wish we all had them. Um, and any movie that comes out, even if it's good or bad, I watch just because I love the idea. But anyway, enough of that. (laughs) Back to this idea that your gift is your superpower. So in fact, we do have these things that take us to the next level, that make us supernatural. Some of us can jump higher than others. Some of us can sing better than others. Some of us can draw better. Some of us can calculate better. Some of us can communicate better. Right. I mean, this we we have these things. Problem is, do you know it? Do you show it? And do you grow it? Y'all, y'all see what I did with the word? No, my y'all didn't even get it. Y'all didn't get it. Let me keep going. So now, <laughs> let me let me say focus. You become rare when you specialize in something. See, you have to master something. You you literally have to master something to become rare to increase your worth, and you will always refine what you invest in. Now on the surface, that sounds like a very great promising message, but let me, let me, let me be honest with you. Some of you guys are really good at being pessimistic, anxious, or fearful because those are the thing that you're invested in or investing in, whether it's by what you watch. Some of y'all are news junkies and you spend a lot of time, a lot of your time during the day, Uh, listening to the negativity, the pessimistic news, the lies, you get caught up in all that. And then you go and watch drama shows. And listen, I'm I'm not knocking that, but too much of anything is a bad thing. So then you go and watch that. And then you go and watch, you know, these shows that are about scandal and all this other stuff. And then you get on social media and you're drawn to all of the drama and the negativity. And you're part of these groups that all they do is talk about stuff that have no relevance, but they are intended to cause you to doubt and fear and worry and be pessimistic. And you wonder why that's where your energy is drained. You wonder why you aren't investing or you aren't growing anything of worth or value. Well, it's because you're investing in the wrong thing. Now, what you're investing in will grow, but you're growing something that will actually come at a deficit for you. You're growing something that will actually take away the potential that will be needed to become valuable. Again, to become rare and thus able to accomplish your purpose, you have to refine your gift. Let me take this a step further. And what I'm about to say may offend some, but you know, such is the truth. (laughs) 
If you don't capture your gift, you will be trapped in a job. See, your job's only purpose should be to finance your gift, to help you refine your gift. Your job's only purpose should be paying you to refine your gift. See, you thought your job was to help finance your living, to sustain your living. And this is why you become dependent on your job. The moment you become dependent on your job, you're working there for the wrong reason. See, your goal in life is not to be employed, but deployed. Most of you guys do a really good job of being employed, so much so that you become dependency on the employment and you are now relegated to using your gift to promote someone else's purpose. Now, listen, I'm not saying you can't use your gift to help someone else's purpose. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that you're not even looking at it like I'm here for a purpose. And my only purpose is to refine what I'm what I'm great at. And you're going to pay me to do that. But I'm not here to stay. I'm, I'm Eventually, I will be deployed and I will be in my own arena doing what God brought me here to do. But a lot of you guys get stuck because you ain't even looking at it like you're, you're on the job to refine your gift. See, whenever I used to, and I'm an entrepreneur now, I have my own business, I have my own private practice. I'm not flexing. This is just, these are facts. But when I used to, whenever I used to work in the mental health space and whenever I worked for an agency or a private practice, like I knew I was there, not because this was where I was going to retire from, but I knew I was there to refine the thing that I thought I was supposed to be good at. And early on in my career, I didn't know what my gift was, but I knew I was there to learn how to refine whatever that was. And so I would spend time, literally, I would spend time, any agency that I ever worked with, I scheduled meetings with the CEO, with the clinical directors or the directors um, or the COO, and I would always go there. I still have notes from the meetings that I would have with them, and I would learn, I would ask them questions. Hey, tell me, how do you get your contracts? How do you secure your contracts? What's the theory that you guys have on hiring and firing? And what makes what I do great and useful? What makes what you do great and useful? How did you get here? What steps did you take? And I was picking their brains and learning and taking notes and asking questions because I knew that this was a refining process. This I, this wasn't my place to, I wasn't here to get your job. And I was even very clear with them. Like, I don't really want your job because this is where you're, this is your assignment. I'm on assignment, but I want to understand your job. I want to learn what you do. And you know what? Some of them, I literally, I, listen, I could, I can pull you, pull the documents up right now. I have, I still have them all saved. Some of them would actually share with me the contracts that they would get from the community, from the state, their contracts. They would share them with me to show me how they did what they did and got what they got. Right. And so I knew I was there on assignment to learn, to grow, to gain more information, but I wasn't there to retire. And some of you guys, you're just so thankful and grateful to have a job that now you're in a position where you're being employed and not even thinking about being deployed. Listen, if you're frustrated on your job, it's because your destiny is calling you. Your destiny will often be the greatest source of your frustration because you're going to go to a job, you're going to be employed, and then you're going to start looking around and asking questions and and you're going to start feeling like, wait a minute, they don't honor what I honor. They don't value my gift. They're looking me, they're not even looking at me and using me appropriately. I was working with a a, a client. Uh, I can't even, I, I wish I could share all the details, but I can't because of course everything is confidential. So I'll just give you the general idea. But I was working with a, a, a client and this particular individual, they, they had this epiphany, like they're extremely qualified. They're extremely valuable. And they had, they, they ran the numbers and they were like, you know what, Liz, look, I am making this organization millions of dollars with what I do. And guess what? I'm only me. I'm the only person that can do what I can do. They know their value. And so because they understood their value, they were employed by this agency or this organization. And what they did was they, you know, they consulted some individuals and then they went and had a conversation with the people at the top and they negotiated. And it was like, look, I don't really like my position anymore. Because I feel like my position is not utilizing what I'm great at. And also, I'm doing things that I don't want to do. But because I know my value, I, here's what I'm willing to do for your job, for this position, for this agency, this organization. 
I'm willing to do X, but I'm not willing to do Y. How can we, how can you guys accommodate that? And before you know it, this job acquiesced. They were like, you know, you're right. You're bringing us X amount of dollars so we can afford, we cannot afford to lose you. We're paying you this, but we should be honoring you at this level. And before you know it, this person created their own position. They're working remote. They're not employed anymore. They're contracting. So they're doing, they're working through their business, contracting their business with this organization. And they're making way more money than they once were. Why? Because they understood their value and they did not sell themselves short. They understood that I'm not here to be employed, but you guys are treating me like I was employed. As a matter of fact, this I remember this person telling me a story and they were saying they were offered a promotion and an increase in pay, but the increase in pay only amounted to an additional $1,000 a month for a promotion that would require them to do additional job functions. And they declined. Why did they decline? Because they knew their value, right? And so some of you guys would be happy to accept that additional $1,000 a month. That's $12,000 a year. Well, you take away taxes and <laughs> here we are, right? But this person understood, I'm not going to yield and I'm not going to fold. I'm going to negotiate because I understand my worth and I understand my value. And I've been doing the work to refine my gift. So there's nobody, I'm rare. There's nobody that can do what I can do. And because I'm rare, you got this, what, what does Thanos say? <laughs> where, where did that leave you? Right back here. Right now, you have to only focus on me because I'm the only person that can do what I can do and what you guys need. So your goal in life is not to be employed, it's to be deployed. But you have to make sure that you're refining your gift and you're becoming a person of value. Now, remember what I said in part one, you were placed in time to influence your generation. So in a sense, you were born to influence time. Now, to do this, you must have an understanding of your purpose in life. And before I wrap up, I want to give you five steps. See, y'all thought this was going to be a long and drawn out part two. It's not, right? I'm going to try to keep it to 30 minutes this time. I know I said that last time. But before I wrap up, I want to give you five steps to actually get started finding out what your life purpose is. Now, if you're not careful, you're going to listen to this information and then you're going to keep it moving. You're going you're gonna to get off this and you, then you're going to move to the next task of your day. I promise you these five questions, these five things will help you to find your purpose. So here's five steps. Step one or question one. What are your gifts? See, your gifts are the unique traits that you are naturally born with. You should be able to answer this question, right? You shouldn't have to take a survey to know the unique traits that you are naturally born with. These are things that you can do that most people can't. Some people may be able to do it, but most people can't, right? Like an NBA player, they are naturally gifted in that realm of athletics. The other people are gifted in that as well. But if you look at the grand picture of the, the, the world, there's only a few people that can do what NBA players can do. Okay, even if you're tall, not everybody are gifted like that. And then to go a step further, there, there's only a few LeBron James or Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan, only a few. When I mean people that they're superior, there's only a few of those. Right. Whether you deem which one of those the goat, the point is there's only a few of those people that's going to be a part of that conversation. But that's what sports. Think about your craft. Think about your space. What is your gift or what are your gifts? What are the unique traits that you were born with? that you have, but most people around you don't have, okay? If you can't find your gift, that means you're not looking at yourself enough, which also may mean you ain't been spending enough time looking at yourself, assessing and evaluating yourself, because you should know what your gifts are, okay? If you can answer that question, you're ready to go to step two, or question number two. What are your talents? So number one was what are your gifts? Number two is what are your talents? See, your talents are unique skills that you naturally are proficient in. So these are things that you just are naturally more skilled at or naturally more proficient at than in other areas, right? So like I look at my daughter who's six and I'm already evaluating. I don't know what her gifts are yet, but I know what her talents are. Well, I know a little bit of her gifts, but I, they haven't crystallized 
bluntly yet, but I'm, I'm noticing she's talented in certain areas. And then there are other areas she's not talented in. Like when, when it comes to math, she's extremely proficient for her age in math. That's just natural. No one, I didn't teach her that. Right. And I'm saying that because I'm her, I, she home, we homeschool her and I'm her teacher. But there are things I didn't teach her that she just naturally has so much so that at six, she's in the third grade. So you have to know what your talents are. And again, If you're not paying attention to yourself, if you're not asking yourself these questions, you could be sitting on some amazing abilities. And what did Miles Monroe say? The greatest place on earth that has the most wealth is the graveyard. There are a lot of gifted and talented people that did not see their gifts, did not see their talents. Therefore, they never they never stepped into that position. And as a byproduct, they died packed full of their gifts and full of their talents. What are the unique skills that you have that you are naturally proficient in that other people aren't or most people aren't? What can you do better than others? And by the way, everybody can do something better than someone else. (laughs) No one is just the average person. Everybody has something unique about them. The problem is we just don't look at ourselves like that. And maybe you were told lies growing up. Maybe no one ever validated or affirmed that in you. Now it's time for you to pay attention to the person that's looking back to you in the mirror. What's the unique skills that you have that you're just naturally proficient in? Some is communi- mine is communicating, or I guess communicating through the realms of writing and speaking, right? Th- those would be areas that I'm uniquely talented in. And also my gift. I have a gift of teaching, a gift of communicating. But then I take that gift and I refine them, I hone them. And so now I'm even more talented than I was four or five, heck, a year ago, right? That's the goal. That's the progression. Now let's move to step three. What are you passionate about? Now this may be a little bit harder to answer, especially if you haven't been asking that question, but your passions are the unique areas of interest that naturally energize you. There are going to be some areas that you are not passionate about. They just don't energize you. You may be on a job right now that you're not passionate about which is probably why you're so frustrated on that job, right? You are in a position that don't energize you, don't take your skill set to the next level. I was speaking with a young man the other day, um, and he works at a a burger place, (laughs) and he was sharing how he's bored on the job. He's young, right? Young man. He's saying how he's bored on the job because it's not engaging anything that he's passionate about. And so now he has this drive, even at a young age, to go and find other uh, places of employment that can actually ignite and energize his passions. And by the way, my recommendation was do it. Go and work in different domains. Different. Don't just stay in the restaurant space. Go and work in other spaces. Do telemarketing or if, if you want, do door to door, but take tests, try things out. And of course, you got to use wisdom because not everything is going to pan out, but you won't know what you are passionate about, a lot of us, until we have options that we are able to touch that's more tangible. For me, college was the, the great equalizer because I was able to go there and learn about a lot of different things that now I can start to, you know, test out. And even in the area of psychology, I didn't know what I would be passionate about until I, and someone gave me the great, this great advice. He said, and this was, I, I can't I think it was when I was in graduate school, um, do not just find one job and stick to that one job. Try multiple areas within the area of psychology. So I did, I worked with sex offenders. I worked with, you know, individuals who were dealing with autism. I worked with juvenile delinquency. I worked with private practice, residential, outpatient. And I had to find, okay, which of these am I more passionate about? Which of these excite me the most? And this is what you're going to have to do. In order to find your passions, you got to ask questions. And sometimes it's as, simp- it's as simple as asking, what moves me? What am I motivated by? What ideas and topics move me? What things do I want to see changed? Sometimes you just got to ask those questions and start to look for the answer. You may not get it as soon as you ask it, but start looking. All right, now let's move to step number four. This is the fourth question. What is your deepest desire? What is your deepest desire? What are the unique ideas or things that you want to see come to fruition? What things do you hate? What things do you love? What things, if you hear about or read about, make you angry? What grievances or things that are wrong in the environment or in society or in the world or in 
family or relationships do you want to see different? What's your deepest desire? Again, this could be hard to find because if you think about it, we, our desires get perverted when we live in this microwave generation where we get what we want too fast. We don't learn how to massage our desires and really see where they come from. Is this desire a byproduct of trauma, a byproduct of a, something that I got when I was young that I wasn't supposed to receive and now this thing is distorted? We don't understand where, where the desires come from. And so we want what we want so fast that we don't take the time to develop our desires. Do you know that the word desire in its original context means of the father? So our desires should be a direct byproduct of our relationship with our spiritual source of the father. And so your desires should look like the heart of God. Now, I'm not saying he's going to tell you what you should desire, but if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, people misconstrue this statement. It's not that you have a desire, a yearning that you really want. I want to be a million, a millionaire, and that's my deepest desire. So if I go and pray and fast, God's going to give that to me. No, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you, he will reveal to you what those desires are that's already come prepackaged. Okay. So you got to spend time focusing on what is of the father. And these are unique ideas and things that you want to see come to fruition. Okay. And then step number five, step number five is what is your current assignment? See your current position in life if leveraged correctly, can further set you up to better live out your purpose. If you're on a job, employed in this season, see it as a seasonal assignment. Do not see this as the end of the journey. Understand that you are on assignment. What does this assignment require of me? Some of you guys are placed specifically in a job where you're supposed to get intel and learn and understand the system of how it works. But because you're there and you're stressed and you're frustrated and you're now distracted by all the other stuff in life, you ain't even asking the right questions. You're not taking advantage of the assignment that you have. Therefore, you will have to stay for a little longer. And then you're over there praying for God to give you a big break. But he's like, look, if I take you to the next level, you're going to squander it. I need you to understand how this works, where you are, so you can take this information to apply to the next level. But if you're not seeing where you are as an assignment, you're going to squander why you're there. Okay? Understand what your current assignment is. Your assignment is your current position. It's not an indefinite position. It's just where you currently are. And the assignment can change and most likely will change. See, I have a current assignment. And I've tried to negotiate with God because I'm like, look, can, can, can this assignment, can we, can we move this along a little? Because there are other things. Like I just told you, I want to I want to write a superhero fiction novel. I want to, I, I, I want to do it. I will do it. But I know I can't do it now because that's not part of my seasonal assignment. And if I do it now, I'm taking away the energy and resources that I should be using to commit to what I'm supposed to be doing to do something that I want to do. And if I fight with God, I will in inevitably lose because I'm going to get what I want, which is not going to be what I need, which is not going to be what other people need from me, which means when I meet you and you're looking to get the answer to your problem from me, well, guess what? I'm going to have the wrong thing. And so some, so think about how that works. Like, let's say I wrote a book, but because I wrote a book in space of the assignment that I'm supposed to be focusing on, I now sell you a book, but the book ain't going to sell because it's, it's, it's in the wrong season. That's like being in Florida and selling winter jackets in the summer. We don't sell winter wear in the summer, <laughs> right? Because it's not, it's in the wrong season. Certain things don't grow down here because it's not the right season. So if you're trying to force something because you want it, you think it's a great idea, but you ain't checking in to see if this is part of your current assignment, then guess what? Those things most likely ain't working. That's the reason why they're not working. Because you're forcing something in the wrong season. You're planting the, the right seed, but in the wrong season. Okay? So you got to understand your current assignment because understanding your current assignment will help you to understand how to leverage it so that you can increase your value so that you can move closer to your purpose. Now, answering these five questions, they'll help you to know the general vicinity of your purpose. 
See these things as a compass that should point you in the direction of your North Star. The North Star is an example of your purpose. All these questions are a compass. And if you answer them, you should know more of where you should be pointed. Okay. The problem is, will you answer these five questions? Okay. So let me conclude. This stuff is so important. I wanted to make sure you get as much as you need. And this is still just the tip of the iceberg. So I want to leave you with three resources. So number one, answer those five questions. This is your action item. Those five questions, answer those. Again, I'm going to go over these questions real quickly. What are your gifts? Question number one. Question number two, what are your, what are your talents? Question number three, what are you passionate about? Question number four, what is your deepest desire? Question number five, what is your current assignment? Now, I want you to answer those five questions. That's your action item. Please do these things because I promise you it will help you. Now, also, an additional action item for those of you who really want to take this to the next level, I'm going to give you three books that if you really read, it will help you to have more clarity. So the first book is Rediscovering the Kingdom by Miles Monroe, I promise you. And this is a series. There's three books in this series. So if you do book number one, you're going to want to do book number two. Um, and book number three is, is decent, but number one and number two are really, really good. But start with Rediscovering the Kingdom. Go to Amazon, get the hard copy or the paperback. I promise you, you will not regret it. The second book I want you to get is Releasing Your Purpose by Miles Monroe. And you'll find a lot of what I shared has been taken from what Miles Monroe talks about, which means that this book will take it to the next level. Okay, so Releasing Your Purpose by Miles Monroe. And then the third book, which I owe my marriage is directly connected to this book is called Success Principles by Jack Canfield. So Success Principles by Jack Canfield. It's a thick book, but each is there's like daily assignments. Really, really good stuff. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. This book is the reason I met my wife. This book is the reason that me and Mandy are married. OK, um, so if I were able to meet Jack Canfield, I would thank him for uh, the gift of my wife in my life because had I not read this book or had we not started working with this book and I ain't going to bore you with the story one day, I probably will. Um, I wouldn't have ever met Mandy, but anyway, releasing the purpose or releasing your purpose, rediscovering the kingdom and success principles, get those three books. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. All right. I am done. <laughs> I really appreciate your time, your energy, your attentiveness, Thank you for joining me for another information-packed episode of the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Now, this podcast episode and the one previous was about purpose and finding your purpose while being married. But the next episode, well, we're going to go back to another topic related to marriage. However, I do employ you guys to ask questions. Contact me, email me, message me. If you do have questions about this, I'm always here to help. But I would like for you to join me in the next episode, episode number 13, where we will talk about another very important topic that you do not want to miss out on. And no, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I have a lot of topics that are already pre-written. God just ain't told me which one yet. So be on the lookout for that. Also, do me a favor. Please remember to leave me a rating and a review. Listen, I am going to iTunes and I'm looking and I'm getting new ratings and new reviews. I really appreciate all of the kind words, guys. But don't forget, you can also go to Spotify. Go to Spotify and give me an honest rating and review on Spotify. I don't have as many there as I should have. So all my Android listeners, please go to Spotify. Give me an honest rating review or wherever you subscribe. If you're a subscriber on CastBox, I really appreciate I really appreciate the new rating and ratings and reviews that I'm getting there. I love reading those. So if you're on CastBox, leave me some more rating and reviews if you haven't done so already. This is how this message is giving to more individuals. The more rating and reviews I get, the, the more publicity I'll have, if that makes sense. Also, don't forget to go to marriagecounselorscorner.com to leave any questions that you may have. Otherwise, guys, keep up the good work. Stay focused. Stay prayerful, stay strategic, stay smart, and I'll speak to you in the next session. Deuces. Thanks for stopping by for your seat on the couch at the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Remember, go to marriagecounselorscorner.com to schedule your next session. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss a session. We look forward to having you back on the couch soon. Bye-bye now.